good y'all welcome back uh you already know what we're doing we're continuing where we left off so far it's just been tragedy after tragedy so i hope we're getting closer to the end i hope it starts getting a little bit more happier towards the end and we end on a better note but let's see where it takes this original video link will be down in the description let's get into the video start thinking about Kenny Irwin's accident, it is a tragedy, but it also makes everybody aware of the problems that they have with the cars, with the racetrack, and everybody's focused, and they're trying to find out ways to make sure this does not happen anymore, and hopefully, they'll make the racetracks a little safer, race cars a little safer, so we don't have to have these kind of shows anymore. Everybody here is thinking about Kenny Irwin. NASCAR is more like a community, and and if a citizen of a community uh, passes away, the community still has to go on. The lights have to work and the water has to run and, and, and life has to go on. And your heart's not in it 100% necessarily, but, but it has to go on. And uh, that's the way we look at, at uh, our schedules. When, uh, it, it, it could have been that we uh, uh, didn't press on yesterday, but I don't know that that would have made it any better. I think a lot of people, for the most part, just soon stay busy. Uh, but but our... our uh, procedures are to press on and um, in cases like this so it's, it's not because we don't have a heart or a soul it's simply because that, that we have a lot of responsibility everybody does in the garage areas to a lot of different people and and the biggest thing is is that that that's what we do we race and that's what Kenny did he races and that's what Adam did he races and and that's what we do and, and it's it's a matter of uh, I think in, in some people's mind, it's it's uh, what's necessary is to press on. I think probably the the fan, uh, the guy at home, watching this on TV or that heard about what happened here with with uh, Kenny. Um, I'm sure he's sitting there saying, "How can those guys? How can they go back out there and and uh, act like nothing happened?" Exactly. Uh, how do they do that? And uh, trust me, in this garage area, Friday. Uh, people were walking around looking at each other like, how can we do this? How can we keep going? Uh, you know, Kenny was a, was a great kid. And we all loved him. And, uh, you know, I, I, felt, I felt really awkward getting in my car and going out on the track because a kid had just lost his life in that corner over there. I, I had to drive down that straightaway right into that same corner. Mm -hmm. Man, I'm... I'm checking my throttle I'm checking my brakes I'm checking my brain what am I doing here we have to learn from this let's don't sweep it under the rug and forget about it let's learn from it let's move exactly forward. I'm not pointing a finger at anybody let's look at the racetrack you know that's two two times right in the two same times spot. same spot right let's look at the let's racetrack be objective about it. let's don't just let it go and say oh it's one of those things let's make some let's let's do something with it let's show that out of respect take some Adam initiative Petty and Kenny Irwin, that we're gonna make some changes. We're gonna look at this a little differently and we're gonna try to prevent it from happening again. From, a, from an old guy that's been in a sport for 30 years, that would give me some comfort. We're taking this thing and we're not just avoiding it. We're not just hoping it'll go away, but we're saying, okay, we had a problem there and we fixed it. That's, that's, that would give me a lot more confidence in the track and NASCAR and everybody involved, it'd give me a lot more respect for everybody involved if it was handled just like an airplane crash. Take the car, a panel of experts puts it back together, mm -hmm. here's what happened. The throttle hung in the floor mat, or the hot throttle hung in the firewall, or the throttle hung under the air cleaner. But something happened, and the throttle hung, there's plenty of people that saw it. So don't tell me, you know, well, we don't know what happened. Ward Burton puts it succinctly, he couldn't have said it any better because he knows the fucking sport. He he said it perfectly. Like, just 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 take some initiative. Look at the track. Look at the car. Try to figure something out. Don't sweep it under the rug. Because then it's just going to make it worse. People are going to be less confident in either driving in that, that track or just driving in general. And either way, you don't want to not be confident when you're driving at fucking, what, 150, 200 miles per hour. You, you need to be confident. Two means there's a problem, he says. It needs to be addressed. On July 10th, NASCAR historian Bob Latford weighs in on if NASCAR has become too dangerous. 
If you just took one lap at each of the 188 tracks that Winston Cup has raced at over 52 years and make it one piece of highway, he says, I doubt there's one equal section of highway in the country that has had that few fatalities over the same amount of time. Two days later, on July 12th, services are held for Irwin at the Abundant Life Church in Indianapolis. At least 500 people attend, including IMS President Tony George. Dozens of red roses adorn the casket. The Reverend Peter Bosworth recalls a conversation with the driver. You know what? I'd drive for free, he told him. I'd race for free. That's my passion. That's my passion. Still, the season pushes forward. One day after the services on July 13th, Truck Series driver Jamie McMurray parts ways with MB Motorsports, owned by Missouri native Mike Mittler. Mittler's team had been around since the start of the series in 1995. That year gave Tony Roper his first two starts in the series at Milwaukee and Martinsville. With McMurray's departure comes an opportunity for the two to reunite. Roper accepts. His first start back with the team will be next month at Indianapolis Raceway Park, site of his career-best runner-up finish two years earlier. Other planned races are Chicago, Richmond, Nashville, and Texas. Three days after the Mittler deal, Kyle Petty finishes fifth at Nazareth, which turns out to be the best run of the season for Adams' car. The team will skip the next race in Pike's Peak, then run the remainder of the season. And a quick word from Kyle Petty, you finished fifth, but from the reaction down here, you won. <laughs> no, I tell you what, it was a great day for the Sprint PCS car, and Chris Huzzy made a phenomenal call that got us up front, like I said. I just had no practice on the racetrack, like the Tour of the Wall down 100 times, took me 50 laps to get used to it. and. Uh, they made a great call, took a 10th place or 15th place driver in a first place car, and we run fifth with it. And uh, I'm just tickled to death. It's like I said, Adam came here and run fourth last year, uh, and I always said he had more talent in his little finger than I've got in my whole body, and I guess that shows it. And just to come here and be able to, to do some of the stuff he done, I'm, I'm pretty proud of these guys, and just thank God. The next day, Team Sabco announces a permanent number change to their Bell South team from 42 to 01. The paint scheme is also changed so the distinctive neon green added to Irwin's car is nowhere on it, perhaps due to the long-standing superstition behind the color. Since most drivers are under contract, the team's driver selection comes down to Todd Bodine and Ted Musgrave. Since Bodine is running the Bush race in Pikes Peak, they pick Musgrave. Sterling Marlin, Irwin's former teammate, will take over the rest of Irwin's four remaining scheduled Bush series starts starting the next month in Bristol. Like Musgrave, Marlin will also run the number 01. Musgrave's first start comes at Pocono, where he runs 16th. That same day... Oh, trouble in turn one. Ricky Rudd into the outside wall. Runs into the outside wall. Oh, man. Looks like maybe the right front tire went down or something because he has hit the outside wall hard. And it started Couldn't even see it happen. Right away. I'm looking at the black marks. You can see his right front is not moving at all. The whole right side of that car caved in. Yeah, I'm, I'm pretty good shape. Just kind of knocked me silly for a second. Hit that wall pretty good down there. Blew a right front tire. Not sure exactly what happened, but cut a right front tire. Blew something on the right front. I, I had it before I turned. Right about time you get ready to turn down in the corner, and uh, all they had time to do is grab some brakes, and that was it. it on was August gl 1st, I'm glad that he's all right. A month of silence. NASCAR issues a technical bulletin to all teams, mandating they two been changes did. to the cars. The first mandates an independent travel stop to keep the throttle plates from opening beyond a vertical position. The second is, in effect, a cutoff switch, a button the driver can press to disconnect power to the ignition system. As it happens, the cars already have such switches, but in each case they have been placed out of the driver's reach. The new regulation requires they be within reach of the driver's thumb, allowing it to be hit at a moment's notice. Both changes go into effect for the upcoming Brickyard 400. Two days before the Brickyard, Tony Roper makes his first truck series start of the season at IRP. He finishes 30th in Mittler's number 26 Ford. The next day, the company Downing Atlanta reports sales figures of their new head and neck restraint device, or Hans device, which has been getting more attention since Adam Petty's wreck in May. Since introducing a new and improved version of the device in late June, Downing Atlanta has sold 35 with another 44 on order. NASCAR's Gary Nelson says he's not ready to make the device mandatory, even though CART and Formula One are already preparing to do Kinda so. Kind of should be mandatory. Part of the reason may be that Bill Simpson is announcing a cheaper alternative to the Hans. Despite NASCAR's inaction, both Ford and General Motors are strongly encouraging their drivers to use the Hans. That same day, after months of speculation, Felix Sabatis finally announces Chip Ganassi will partner with him in 2001, forming a new two-car team running Dodges, Chip Ganassi Racing with Felix Sabatis. 
August 5th. The Brickyard 400, held in Kenny Irwin Jr.'s hometown, is run on what would have been Irwin's 31st birthday. It was here three years ago he was announced as Robert Yates' new driver, here one year ago that he all but knew he was out of that car, and here today the race is dedicated in his honor. Thirty-one years ago today, a boy was born on the east side of Indianapolis, in the shadow of the Indianapolis Motor Speedway. As he grew, so did his passion for racing. Kenny Irwin will be shown in four spots. And as a young man, he distinguished himself this with is a his nice little video. Ladies and gentlemen, the seventh running of the Brickyard 400 is dedicated to the memory of Kenny Irwin Jr. That's really nice. At 11 a.m. local time, balloons are released at the track. An hour later, more balloons fly near Team Sabco's offices in Mooresville. The Mooresville tribute is arranged by Debbie Musgrave, wife of Ted, Irwin's replacement. In the race itself, two drivers aren't in the field because of injuries. Terry Labonte briefly lost consciousness in this crash at Daytona a month earlier, then wrecked hard again at Loudoun. This ends Labonte's Ironman streak at 655 straight starts. Also missing is Jeremy Mayfield, who is hurt in a crash during practice. His relief driver is Kyle Petty. At a crossroads both professionally and personally, Petty will hand over driving duties of the number 44 after Bristol to focus on Adams' Bush Series car. Steve Grissom will drive once again, but in the final 11 races will fail to qualify seven times. Just looking at on the August speeds. August 12th, Tony Roper makes his second truck start at the Nashville Fairgrounds, besting 11 other drivers who fail to qualify. He finishes in last place, out with engine failure. He doesn't attempt the next race at Chicago Motor Speedway, which happens to see NASCAR's first live test of the new cutoff switch. On lap 124, Rob Morgan's throttle sticks heading into turn one. Morgan hits the button, cutting power to the motor and avoiding a hit to the outside wall. He recovers to finish 23rd. Oh, Three wow. Later, That's great Kyle that he Penny recovered. A check for $10,045 to the Brenner Children's Hospital in Winston-Salem. Jayski reports that some kind of foundation in Adam's memory is in the planning stages. September 2nd, Irwin is inducted into the Darlington Record Club for being the defending pole sitter of the upcoming Southern 500. With 13 days until opening practice for the next Cup Series race at New Hampshire, Jeff Gordon, Dale Jarrett, and Rusty Wallace are insisting softball barriers must be added to the turns before they race there. NASCAR's Mike Helton disagrees. Helton instead considers a change to the cars. He and his team consider possible aerodynamic changes and dropping the maximum cubic inch limit from 355 to around 305. All this comes amidst a possible change in management at NASCAR, as Jim France is rumored to take the place of Bill France Jr. The next day, there's a rumor of a possible driver's strike at New Hampshire, which would be the first since the inaugural Talladega race in 1969. Bobby Labonte, the series point leader, says he'll race whether changes are made or not, but also says he's not happy about it. Days earlier, Labonte wins the Southern 500 in a backup car. His primary is destroyed in a crash after his throttle hangs going into turn three. Labonte walks away, but is clearly shaken by the accident. I can tell you it scares the heck out of you when your throttle sticks like that, he says. You're in a panic. It would appear that you could just reach up and shut the engine off, but at a place like this where you're going so fast, it's tough. September 8th, one week until... That shit's probably Hampshire, terrifying. ...one day after Roper finishes 21st in the Truck Series race at Richmond. NASCAR approves a live test of an automatic version of the cutoff switch. Called a dumb switch, the system developed by Jack Roush uses sensors to automatically shut off the engine, and the device detects 850 to 900 pounds of brake pressure while the throttle is at or nearly full open. Six teams are slated to run it, but all are concerned after Bobby Labonte's car is found to have a faulty sensor. At the same time, a new rumor begins that NASCAR is planning on instituting restrictor plates in New Hampshire and that teams are already preparing their engines for next week. During the weekend's racing at Richmond, Elliott Sadler runs a plate during practice. It costs him one second a lap. Two days later and five days before practice, NASCAR confirms they will mandate restrictor plates for the following week's race in Loudoun. 
Not only will they be mandated for Cup, but also the Bush North Series race held the day before. And before each practice, teams will also take so-called pre-practice laps behind the pace car to ensure proper brake temperature. There's one big catch, however. NASCAR won't allow any testing at Loudoun prior to the race. Steve Park, Dale Jr., and Jeff Burton test at Milwaukee. Dale Earnhardt tests at Greenville Pickens, joining a pre-planned test for Bush Series driver Kevin Harvick. Around this time, Earnhardt speaks out about the lingering controversies during a rare interview by his hauler. And what his does he have to are say? In two articles in the September 14th issue of NASCAR Scene. He first agrees that NASCAR had to do something, but takes issue with what he perceived to be unproductive negativity. He also disagrees that the Oval in New Hampshire is particularly unsafe. It's not a totally safe situation anywhere you race, he says. I accepted that when I came into racing. Earnhardt also offers a theory of his own for what caused the two fatalities. During a conversation with Dave Marcus about why they wear open-face helmets, the two not only insist their helmets are safer, but that full-face helmets are dangerous. Why aren't they safe, asks Earnhardt of the full-faced helmets. Because you slam your face into them, says Marcus. And what does it do to the back of your neck when you hit? You break it, right here, says Marcus, pointing to the base of his neck. That leverage point is there, and your head keeps going. Something's got a bust back there. Then, Earnhardt says, it's like somebody puts a noose around your neck and throws you off the gallows. Though it is true that Earnhardt never uses the Hans device, this last quote will be attributed incorrectly to Earnhardt's mistrust of it. Marcus is likewise not against advances in safety. Just over a year earlier, he survives this brutal crash at Pocono, thanks to a special shoulder strap attached to his helmet. Pioneered by fellow driver Phil Barkdahl, the horse collar style device has since been adopted by ARCA. One track. I feel like once they seen that it does work and it does help and prevent injuries from happening, it should have been mandatory. But I will say that they did good with implementing some new safety features. Um, like I said, sadly, was after the, the two, well, three. But still, they implemented some new features that could help make things a little more safer for the car and the person driving, which is great. Um, so we're getting that happier note. Things things seem like they're starting to get better, but we still got we still got one left. So I hope you guys are enjoying the reaction. Like, comment, subscribe, and I'll see y'all next video. I love y'all. Peace. They wanna fall. Back when I was down bad, was stuck in the mud. That nigga didn't clean up Louis V on the so so.